order the downtown development authority business meeting on May 16th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, roll call. Or how, how about I do the roll you call? You do the roll call. <laughs> John Bortles, are you here? I am here. <laughs> Schneider. Here. Heaney. Here. Rush. Here. Brown. Here. Valdez. Here. And Chair Oxman is not here today. Excellent. Uh, next up, approval of the May 16th agenda. With a change. With what? With a change. With a change. Which she would like to delete 60. Oh, um, with a change that she would like to, we would like to delete uh, 60, the additional architectural fencing replacement parts for lack of correct data at this point in time. So moved. <coughs> Second. Right. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Yes, I got through my first. <laughs> <laughs> um, now you can just fall sick for the rest of Right, right. Um, all right, any public comment? Right? No, ma'am. Excellent. All right, well, um, next up, the consent agenda, which includes approval of minutes, March 28th. Um, the approval of two grant requests, one for Woody's Pizza Exterior Improvement and Foss Company Incorporated Exterior Improvement Grants. I have a recommendation, um, Madam Vice Chair, that um, since Commissioner Bortles um, is an applicant, he had asked by email to recuse himself, so maybe do two different votes? Okay. Just to keep it all good? How okay. about three different, the approval of the minutes? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, let's go ahead and see if there's approval of minutes for March 28th business meeting? Uh, sure, I move to approve the minutes from the March 28th business meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Right. <coughs> Next up. Thank um, you, John. <laughs> Woody's Pizza Exterior Improvement Grant, which John Bartles will recuse himself of. Um, uh, can I get a motion to approve the um, consent agenda exterior improvement grant? Sure, I move to approve the Woody's Pizza Exterior Grant request. Excellent. Who would like to second that? All favor? Aye. Aye. And last but not least, the Foss Company's um, exterior improvement grant request. Uh, and would like to approve, uh, sure, I move to approve the Foss Company <laughs> Inc. exterior yeah. improvement oh, okay. grant request. This is my job on council. So you gotta keep <laughs> Excellent. We gotta get All out right. of here. Very Second. Tasty. All right, Dean. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. All right. Including John. Thank you, John. <laughs> All right, uh, next up is business. Um, Mr. Glick. Can I make oh, one yes. comment real quick? I would like to go off the agenda a little bit by just welcoming Noah to oh, our group. Oh, what a great idea. Okay. Yay. And we forgot to We forgot edit. to put that in. <laughs> There's like an old hat around here. You know Noah so well. I've been around the black a few times. Thank great. you. You're welcome. Yay, thank you. Dean. You're as new as I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> Except for you've done this before. Yeah, not very long. <laughs> um, all right. Well, welcome, Noah. Thanks. Um, next up, business. Um, I think Mr. Glick is going to talk to us about discuss the city council arts and cultural strategic goal. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. So the um, There have been two parallel conversations for a number of years uh, going on in the city, um, one of which relates to are we um, as coordinated and um, with a comprehensive or a rather shared vision in an articulated way handling the internal things that the city does related to arts and culture, specifically we have, a, we have great museums that our city owned. Uh, we have a public art commission. Um, we, uh, we, the DDA, provide some funding. The city manager's office also provides some funding for culture. So there's all these internal things that have just evolved in kind of an ad hoc manner. They just evolved the way they evolved. Um, but at the same time, the relationship of the city with the cultural elements in the community has been a topic of conversation of can and should the city do more to support arts and culture in the community because it's, in, it's important to our community character and in policy documents like uh, Golden Vision and the Comprehensive Plan, et cetera. And perhaps in our context, from an economic point of view, it's also important in that our cultural attractions are one of the reasons that the downtown is a thriving location. 
So um, somewhat interrupted by the pandemic, the city council's been uh, working on a strategic plan for a couple years, and most recently last fall, uh, worked to identify um, five or six, five or six um, success factors in the community. And one of them includes um, arts and culture. And the strategic goal was specifically, as I listed in italics, defined cultural goals and engagement opportunities. That's how broad it was. It's in the top paragraph on page two. That um, even though there's all sorts of efforts underway, it's never really been defined from a city point of view. So right before the meeting, I was joking with Dean that I was kind of voluntold to take on this project for council um, in my role with the city manager's office of doing stuff when assigned. And so I uh, went to speak to council in March without a cl clear um, direction. Um, I asked council for some more um, background on their reasoning for the goal, what they wanted to get out of it, and the four bullet points on page two are what I got from council that night. Um, specifically that um, we have a long history of policy and programming support uh, to the non-city entities. It's been largely on an ad hoc basis rather than a clearly articulated vision and <coughs> funding program. And a lot of times things do come down to funding. Um, one of the other triggers for this was the fact that council last year in looking at the lodging tax indicated that in addition to visitor impacts, one of the potential uses of lodging tax funds could be um, some to be determined level or format of arts and culture support under the category of thriving community. Um, the two categories for lodging tax were going to be um, visitor impact, which was seen to be about 20% of the funding, at least early on, and then um, thriving community projects, which could, could be city capital projects, city programs, and could uh, ostensibly also be non-city things, um, which is where the culturals came in. So um, we haven't been focused and clearly articulated, and the <clears throat> clearly the city's role will be different for things that it does compared to things that other people do in the community. And so that's, that's why one of the questions to all the entities that I've been talking to in groups is, um, what should the city's role be? Recognizing that it's probably not role, it's probably roles, that we would have a different role. And city Council clearly understood and that they do not want to nor expect that anyone would want them to um, have a coup and take over all the cultural entities in, in the community. So um, clearly there will be different roles or different subsets of a role. Um, and the council's goal to me was to define and impl implement a more formalized and cohesive approach and structure to enhance the coordination, effectiveness, and the community awareness. So nice words, but then you get down to how. Um, that was for the uh, for everyone, including the public, um, the city stuff, and then for the, the other entities. So I've been on a kind of a road trip to various boards, commissions. Um, we'll be talking to the Civic Foundation this week. I uh, talked to the Visit Golden folks last week and um, various others. And with our hat on as either the role of culture towards enhancing the vitality of downtown or the fact that the DDA has given up Use, I like to use double and triple negatives as much as I can, a, a not insignificant amount of funding to um, specifically Foothills Art Center, Miners Alley Playhouse, the Visitor Center, which may or may not be a cultural entity. We still have to define what things are. Um, we've been giving um, like about 10% of our overall budget, I would think, but, um, of overall expenditures to arts and culture over the years. So with that in mind, the specific question for as few minutes or many as you want to talk about it is, uh, given the range of public, nonprofit, and private organization elements and cultural activities, what role should the city take to encourage, nourish, and support this aspect of the community? And then the second one is harder if you haven't been doing research. Um, are there examples of other places that 
you think do a good job. Like there are some cities in the metro, many cities in Colorado or other states that have a more formalized um, relationship with, between the city government and the cultural community. So everyone's responses are different based on their perspective and their, their, their background. But those are the two questions, if anyone is willing to have conversation about them. Is there a problem? I mean, this almost sounds like you're trying to find a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. I mean, yeah, you've got a lot of different groups and entities, but is there, is there a coordination problem? Is there a, I mean, I, I don't see there's a problem with the various groups funding their little pieces and supporting their little pieces. Internally, there, there's a debate that it could be done better internally. That um, pu public art and the museum could be more closely aligned in how they're administered. And there's no real reason why movies and music in the park are put on by the communications department other than that's the way it is. So from those three examples, the problem could be would it make sense to consolidate those types of activities in a single division in some department? That's kind of the way internal in the weeds version. Um, is, there, is there a problem that the museums, the advisory board regarding museums is the Parks and Recreation and, and Museums Advisory Board and Public Art Commission um, is itself? Um, their belief is that arts and culture are more than um, a set of 30 or 40 statues and some murals around the community, that the cultural element in the community is more than that. For the non-city folks, I think the issue is, I wouldn't call it a problem, is that um, <coughs> if there is going to be um, direct funding provided, and one example that the culturals have used is like a mini version of the scientific and cultural facilities district that sometimes we vote for that they have the signs of a polar bear when you vote for that sales tax regional sales tax it's a big blue bear no the, on the signs it's a white bear oh never mind because <laughs> it <laughs> better look at, at any rate um, i think there needs to be a, a well thought out process for accountability <clears throat> and transparency and figuring out how to provide funds for them if we're going to so no, not necessarily a big problem, but not everything on the strategic plan are problems. Some of them are just projects. So Steve, here's, here's what I was first gonna ask. Does this have anything to do with the lodging tax? And you had to answer that, which I assumed it did. Um, you also have, so for sake of discussion, you said museum, public art commission, then along this we would have probably Foothills Art Commission or Art Foothills Art Center, Myers Alley Playhouse and all that. And so I, I'm kind of, I agree with what you said for the most part, um, JJ, but I, I just think that some entities, all they really want is money because they can run their own organization. So when you ask for like organization recommendations, I, at this juncture, I would not be, a, I would not be in favor of having money spent organizationally on a city employee to manage this or be involved with this because to me, Foothills Art Center is more than capable of operating on their own. Myers Alley Playhouse is more than capable of operating on their own with their own board and their management, et cetera. And then if you extend it to the city-run entities like the museum, the, the Golden Museum, History Museum, you know, I, you know, that's a golden entity, so I could see why that would be applicable to the city, because it's right now it's a city entity. Um, I'm not saying there's probably ways to coordinate better, but I don't know what to really coordinate better. I mean, I think it, you know, it would be better for Foothills Art Center and Myers Light Playhouse to get together and have this, these discussions, and which it might be because they're right, you know, and plus there's a couple other things I want to just throw out. You have this huge funding source and where's it gonna go? And I would suggest that it shouldn't go to like the museum that's already funded by the city unless it's an incremental thing. So let's say the museum costs $500,000 for the city. I have no clue what it costs. Well, that should still be budgeted for the, muse the current budget. If it's above that, let's say they're doing another project that's gonna require another 100,000. Well, maybe in a given year, that lodging tax could go to the museum for that, but it shouldn't be used to, off to, to fund the museum 
and take money from the city that's already dedicated to that for all these years that it's been budgeted for. And the other thing is, you know, you have also short-term and long-term goals. Like right now, the shorter-term goals are current projects are Foothills Art Center, for example, and Miners Alley Playhouse. You know, those are near-term projects that need assistance and help. But then fast forward three to five years when they're up and running and they got their debt paid off or a lot of it paid off or whatever, it's then it's, you know, maybe that, that focus shifts. Right now we got two huge monsters <coughs> Of, program, of projects that could use money. But in, in a, you know, five years or four years or three years, that, might, that need might not be there. And then where do you use that million dollars a year that we're gonna get the lodge tax? So it's a big question and I think it's a good idea, but I don't think, going back now to JJ's point, I don't know if, if it requires an organization other than people just having good communications with each other. And I'm not disagreeing, it could be a, maybe a little bit coordinated better but um, that's just my thought. But I think we have to have short and long-term well, thinking. Let me respond a little bit. One is, uh, do you know how many people are in the Cultural Alliance, other of you, about 15? Yeah. yeah. There's about 15 <laughs> cultural entities in an existing organization called the Golden Cultural Alliance, right. whose job is to coordinate among themselves and not all have events on the same day and hmm. that type of stuff. Um, the reference to organizational here is for the city. It's for, um, should there be some sort of reorganization of, um, and without making anyone too nervous, between the way parks, the Public Art Commission and the Parks Board separately supervise their elements of the city cultural infrastructure. Um, a lot of the cities that we're looking at do have a nonprofit board that the city is a member of that doesn't take additional city resources, and that's one way that coordination is improved. Um, but what the culturals are asking for, including those two that you mentioned a few times, they're not asking for capital funds. They're asking for operating funds at a much lower level than you might think, um, similar to the way that SCFD funds are, are doled out, that fundraising for capital is way easier than fundraising for operating. So their, their claim is that what they really need from the city is some help in operating expenses so that they can do their job better and they can go out and raise money for other things. But the, I did write down budget existing city programs from existing sources, not lodging, um, because that I think is a relevant point that has been made and will be made is don't just use the lodging tax to fill up another pocket that's mm -hmm. already funding something. But do you have any guidance for us? As we're going this way. Uh, uh, well, uh, no, I mean, I, I think, when he, so you sent around a whole bunch of things to city council when we were in part of these discussions. And I think what was really interesting to look on those is that some of those cities were able to, when these talk about a vision, they would talk about, they would tie how the money was spent back to what they were trying to achieve. And so you could link back and see why, why are we, why do we want to budget money towards arts and cultural things? And what do we want to get out of that? And so, like the the Boulder example, I thought was really kind of cool. They would, they could, they had a, a whole plan about what they wanted to achieve with their arts and cultural funding, and then they had targeted grants that they would give out in a year, and people would apply for grants and different money. And some were very logical, like, hey, it's really expensive now. You know, uh, doing anything in any building is really expensive because real estate is really expensive. So here's one grant that is just targeted for programs and it helps them offset costs of like, you know, running a Buffalo Road space or something to hold an event. Or we wanna have a bunch of grants that's, that would be directly targeted for um, elementary school programs for kids to do arts and cultural stuff for kids. And then here's a part of money that you can apply for doing stuff there. And then they would link it all back to their, you know, their vision goals and what. And I think what's appealing about that is that, um, we're doing a bunch of things, and I think we even talked about this like a little bit at the end of last year. Like, we're giving some grant money, and I think there was some conversation about, but what are we, why, and what exactly are we achieving, and how closely are we tying what the the requests are to what our goals as an organization? And I think it's kind of the same thing with the city, bigger city. Okay, this nothing's broken, but if we suddenly have some extra pot of money coming in from that lodging tax. Do, do we want a, a more structured 
thoughtful approach of how we distribute that to know what we're getting out of it again, right? Because there's other things we could be spending money on too. We don't, there's the cultural pot of money, but you know, that thriving communities is pretty broad. I mean, we can, there's a lot of options for us. And just one other little thing, there are some cultural organizations that are not in downtown that don't get funding from the city or the DDA. <laughs> really they don't get funding from the DDA, so they don't necessarily get some funding from the city. Yeah. It'll be interesting to know what they all are and how important they are in the terms of the priority list, et cetera, et cetera. Well, just defining cultural, I mean, is the railroad museum cultural? Could be. Is arts, well, we've, we've done the Christmas lights every year, is that arts? I mean, it, you could define it a lot of different ways. Oh, yeah, that's what I think you yeah. guys are, right? Well, Isn't that a goal of council to define? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think there's so many different textures, of, like you said, of culturals, right? You have the Golden Music Choir, for example, that are just a bunch of residents that come together, and I define that as cultural. And then you also have, like, you know, the bigger ones like Miner's Alley Playhouse, and you have the History Museum, and you have the Art Center, and, you know, they they kind of overpower just because, not, not intentionally, just because they're bigger organizations, right? And so, like, so how do, to Casey's point, I think that's important is, you know, do you have these smaller grants targeted to, like, the music choir, or maybe a, a PTA to put on a craft or something, I don't know what it is, um, it, more defined, and then you have these capital grants that are, are larger, and then every year you have buckets, and you, so when you're out of money, you're out of money. Um, I think with the operations, um, the only thing I would, I, I'd be cautious of, is that every year, um, do they, do they just expect it to come to them? You know what I mean? Like, is there an actual need or do they expect it to come to them? Um, and so I think that needs to be defined so that there's an actual need because it's very easy to say, okay, this is my budget. I'm going to add this amount that I know that I'm going to get from the city. And I don't think that's necessarily right either. So, Well, and definitely that, that is the, the big risk. Um, the way that I learned about, I learned, I learned a lot about SCFD. Um, the, the only limitation other than each entity that qualifies, and there's different tiers based on how big your budget is and how many people you serve, um, is you can you can ask for up to 25% of your operating, and the limitation is really how much sales tax the regional district collects. And so they divvy it up to by county, and then there's a county committee that decides. So everyone in Jefferson County asks for 25% of their operating budget. And then there's also some other grant programs sometimes, but the, the one that becomes an entitlement is they ask for that and they get some percentage of that based on the total pot of money being uh, divvied up. So the bigger ones get more, the smaller ones get less, and it becomes, their, they feel entitled to it. And, um, not totally related, but what I thought council wanted and I went to them in November with was a grant application project where everything would be grants. And we, we may go back to that. Um, the main thing is council doesn't want to do it themselves. So that would be the need for somebody to be running the internal part of it is to assure transparency and accountability for any taxpayer funds that are distributed. But um, that, that is a great point that if, if it becomes a formula, it will become um, an expect, expectation. And also, since see the reference to the organizational stuff internal to the city, not telling the nonprofits how to run their organizations. It's how the city should run itself and all of that support nurturing kind of thing. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Is this coming from these organizations, or is this coming from city council saying, we think the organizations need to get together? Get together? Or are the organizations saying, we want to have some kind of management to to coordinate our efforts, or somebody else telling them, we think you ought to have some kind of management to Neither. coordinate your efforts. Neither. Okay. Um, they definitely don't want anyone managing or interfering well, with their yeah, efforts. I, I mean, they want funding, and they understand that what comes with funding is accountability for the use of the funds, record keeping, reporting, transparency, those types of things. Um, and 
if, if part of the requirement for accounting is that they coordinate among themselves and try not to have too many conflicts, that will be their requirements. But they are certainly not looking for anyone to micromanage their activities, and neither is council looking to do that. That was the biggest part of the conversation was this is not an this is not a an intent to go out and take over all of these organizations, but rather to have a little bit of structure, if indeed, for the outside ones, a little bit of structure, if indeed we are going to provide them more funding, which is not defined, it's not a decided question. There's a movement in that direction. And that is there a better way for us to do it internally than grants from the city manager, grants from DDA, um, museums in one de department and one advisory board and arts in another, and no overall advice to council because they don't want to think about it, basically. They want to have an internal structure that handles it, that thinks about these kind of things and makes recommendations to council when necessary for policy. Although I think we want to think about the budget. Like, I, I, we want to be able to say, here's our pot of money of the city budget that we were, we're going to set aside. And we then we want to know <laughs> that there's a thoughtful process to take that budget and go do something great with it uh, that achieves good things and that is that the spending is a little coordinated. It's not just hodgepodge. Anyone who comes gets some money. And, right? It's, it's a little more plain and than thoughtful. You don't have to spend it all year too. I think there's some growth plan in there too. I mean like, you know, maybe you have a, you spend 80% a year for, because you then, to Dean's point, you have these massive capital projects that come about mm -hmm. that need, you know, an influx of more money um, and too. So I, I think that budget. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a, nice, it's a big, you know, it's forecast to be a million dollars if it's just dumped on basically accounts to figure out how to spend it. So I understand why, hey, we got to figure out what the best use of it. And I would say, you know, short term, Opportunities longer term, or and think about it like that as well. Mm -hmm. But Steve, I have a question. Do you guys know uh, are most art museums or like Denver Art Museum and uh, Nature and Science Museum are those Denver City owned entities? That's how it usually works. Because I was going to wonder. I was wondering, you know, would there be an opportunity to take the museum, Gold Golden History Museum, to a a, a nonprofit? The, on its own, a standalone. I think that's what it used but to be. Normally, they don't. But so cities normally, that's oh, the norm. Oh. Well, no, I don't know about the norm. In Denver, they are part of this huge department. Okay, arts so they're and not. Venues. Yeah, arts history and museum, botanic gardens, art. You know, they have separate boards, but they're all related. In I don't know. Is that Red Rocks too? Maybe? Yeah, Red Rocks. Red is Rocks part is of arts, arts and venues. venues. Betcher? Uh, Buffalo Bill Museum is probably part of them. No, Betcher is Jefferson County. Sorry. But the, the Golden Museum, um, and then when Astor House was active as a museum, became city museums because of operational concerns um, about the nonprofits. They were nonprofits for decades. Mm. They, they just ended up not being. But these are actually very good comments. And, and good pushback. Can I ask yeah. one more question? Yeah. When the council says thriving community, what does that? What's that defined as? Oh, we, we should get you the whole thing. I, I have yeah. the strategic plan. Well, I've seen it a couple times, but I'm just curious. Like, is it resident focused? Is it tourist focused? I know the lodging tax is the eighty twenty or whatnot, but yeah. a thriving community means a lot to. It does, and there's a whole lot of words around it, and okay. it's in a separate plan than the annual strategic plan. It was a whole big uh, planning effort we did. We had a consultant who helped get us through and put it all together, okay. and we defined what it meant. And if we were looking for like what are outcomes that we want to achieve, and okay. one of those was that thriving. And there's a lot of words with it that I can't remember okay. off the top of my head, but we can find that. We can do that yeah. as well as yeah. so. In in the strategic plan work plan, there are 10, 20 projects under that category okay. of. Well, no, that's not one of the, that is one of the categories, yeah, affordable and thriving. Right, so that's so the has, council work plan. That right, right. It has, but it has lots of different things under affordable and thriving. When council was talking about this specific potential funding source last year, it was things that would create a measurable, significant benefit to the community that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Like, things that we could already fund don't count, but things, things that are, added benefit to the community. Because so I might be opening a whole can of worms here, but I just feel like, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out, we have all this extra money suddenly, 
And we're trying to figure okay, out. It's not very much. But it was <laughs> no, actually no. Not, it's already triply spent. <laughs> then, okay. But I just feel like, you know, we have all these, like, when you talk about thriving community, we have all these other, like, just basic core needs. And, you know, to the cities, you know, our previous city manager, like, they don't want to be, a, you don't want to be an event-based city putting on events. You want the culturals to take those on. You do, like, you know, the candlelight walk and things like that. And um, I just feel like we have all this extra fluff and like and we're not to the core of what a city should be doing and we still have potholes we still have not enough firefighters we do, you know we have potholes we have you know we have um, standard sidewalks yeah we have trash that's not picked up we have you know those <laughs> types of things that um that's a thriving community too so can that define farther but i just feel like this is a lot of extra like first world problem we have <laughs> Sorry, I'm opening well, the whole can of worms. I think the goal was like families who are thriving because they can make money and they can afford to live here, okay. and the schools are good. It wasn't just a, what's a fluffy thing we can buy. Okay, it's defined much more like okay. people and, are thriving because they're happy and, and enjoying and, themselves. Okay. And, and this part of it, a living. this part of it was intended to be a. I don't know what was intended. It was discussed as a. Um, somewhat minor portion of what the effort would be. Okay. Um, and what makes it more difficult is that it is, um, it is basically granting money or giving money to third parties. And so there needs to be some structure to make sure it's done well. The, the in what I think council meant, um, and in the, whenever I wrote memos of saying what I thought they meant, that the majority of it would go to city directed stuff that fits under that okay. um, projects or programs. That not everything is a capital project. A lot of things are programs. But um, the, what, what came up was, well, um, we have this whole non-governmental organization, NGO part of our community that adds to the quality of life. And should we be considering them for their share? Yeah. Which is. I don't know how much it is. Yeah, I know. But, but that is that is a good point. The and one of the things that it's not worth your time to worry about is um, we are obligated by many laws to fund different things out of different buckets okay. that are like water and wastewater cannot be supported by tax money. It is it's an an enterprise under Tabor Taxpayer Bill of Rights, and it is supported by fees and um, fees and charges. And that's one reason it doesn't ever give anything to anybody. <clears throat> so we try to separate okay. uh, functions. But the general fund being the big fund that fund, handles all of operations. But Noah was going to say something. I'm just curious what the alternative is. You spoke to some degree about having somebody kind of oversee the larger project here. Like, if we, if we decide or city council decides that they're not going to appoint somebody to do that, what's the alternative? Everybody acts independently. Well, for I think for organizationally the status quo, uh, I think the alternative is there is not a grant program for cultural entities unless somebody is running it. Okay. They could give the money to DDA, but recognizing that not everything is in the city, or um, the the I would never call it. Um, dirty laundry, but the the way that things happen oftentimes is just because. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, Casey is actually very understanding of my version of how things happen sometimes, that people kept asking council for money. And so, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, that city manager, Mike Bester, um, went to council, or I was probably involved because I got sucked into things mm -hmm. about, well, we should have a grant program. Well, who should figure out who should run the grant program? Well, council wants to know that it's run well, but they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden we have a grant program in the city manager's office with not very much money in it that schools can apply to annually so, um, so, that, so that they benefit, but in some degree so that we feel better that we're, we're helping a little bit. Yeah. Schools can apply, special events can apply that aren't in the downtown area. Um, the one thing we, we have managed to do is not have people double dip. Mm -hmm. And that was Gura at the time, not DDA. Mm -hmm. that, um, you couldn't go to the city for an event grant in downtown as well as for Gura. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just, it, it just evolved. So 
if council decided to do nothing, we either just meander along the way we're going, or the problem is turning off the spigot. And now that um, the manager and DDA, we inherited this from the Urban Renewal Authority. Um, it's, um, I guess it's beneficial that the DDA board felt that certain numbers of the grants are appropriate, mm -hmm. but it would we would have gotten pushback if we decided not to do grants um, because people got used to it in the downtown for arts area. And culture. Well, for arts yeah. and culture. Any other thing? And all of them we inherited from from the Urban Renewal Authority, and the, re the reason we continued them is because the DDA felt they were valuable. But later this year, there is going to, I'm going to do an analysis with my grant subcommittee <laughs> to look at the DDA grant program. Does it need any tweaks? Does, should it, and it'll be very important as a result what the outcomes of this will, should the DDA providing, be providing arts and culture grants? What would that look like? How does that play into what council ultimately decides? And then there's the business grants, but it's all related. And if the DDA is providing partnership opportunities, um, the, the ones that are receiving funding every year, um, specifically Pluto's Art Center, Minders Alley Playhouse, and the Visitor Center, mm -hmm. we stopped calling those grants because we wanted grants to be more limited time or one-time type things to get your event going or yeah. just do your little project. Um, if the city had a robust funding program, I would be recommending that the DDA should get out of that business. I mean, we should put our resources to other other targeted things downtown because uh, there's no need to duplicate it. Mm -hmm. But those are outcomes that who knows which way will go. Mm -hmm. This has actually been helpful. Sorry, <laughs> Believe it or no. <laughs> um, I've been to a few of these. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everyone is different. <laughs> okay, so um, the second thing, um, equally confusing and sometimes unhappy, is downtown construction updates. Stuff's happening. <laughs> so um, it's going to be a busy summer, although it looks like it'll be also fall. We have, as Dean said, we're going to have two large construction projects happening in one block, which really won't affect, well, it'll affect. So there'll be, um, and it's not like there'll be tremendous growth, but there'll be some, we don't know. About. So the point is those two wonderful projects are happening. The boring is going on right now. There might be other boring later in the summer related to Comcast, mm -hmm. I have to think who it was. Public Works is, and then at some point, downtown street resurfacing. So the city has this great new um, resource at the bottom of each weekly newsletter on Wednesday, sign up for it if you're not already signed up, is now an interactive right-of-way permit map where it gets updated every time there's an, a right-of-way permit issued, and they are issued every day all over the city, and you can see. <laughs> um, so what's happening? So if business, so we're, I'm going to be doing a little communication email to the downtown business community like, all this great stuff is happening, and here's how you find out what's happening. If you want to know about something, you can just go onto this interactive map. It's available all the time on the city website, so there's a link, but it's always there. And you'll be able to see what's happening where, how long it's going to be, and that kind of thing. And just all this, all the stuff that's happening is going to make for an even better downtown, and here's how you can manage, you as a business can manage what's, what's happening, and related to that, um, Public Works is working very, very hard to minimize impacts to the businesses and so forth. Um, so at such time, for example, if and when the street resurfacing thing happens, and that's not for a couple of months, it's not scheduled yet, there will be times that like the right-of-way enclosures will have to be moved because they have to resurface the street. So we will have a plan way in advance for Public Works and the Streets Department to come Take away the fencing for as short amount of time as possible, do the street resurfacing, put it back, <laughs> kind of thing. So that's a little bit of a communicate. Just wanted to let you know that this resource happens. I'm going to be sending out an email, hopefully this week, to the downtown business community. Like, please sign up for the weekly e newsletter and check this map if you have questions about any of the um, closures. That includes special events, you know. Buffalo Bill days, you know, anything like that, construction, events, all that kind of stuff. So we just want to be out in front and let 
the business community know? So I don't, I don't recall, all the years I've been here, I don't recall a lot of that kind of work being done in the summer. Now I get, you gotta do it when it's good weather, you can't be doing it with snow, so I get that. Is that true? Is it usually All right, well, so yeah. for example, none of the paving will happen until mid-September at the earliest. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and so one of the, and not all of downtown, um, the only, John, John, are you there? Yep, I'm here. The only block of Washington Avenue that's being paved is from 13th to 14th because we've put it off for three or four years to coordinate with your structure that stayed out there. So one of the, we, we don't think we can wait till November 1st to pave that block of Washington. And I can't remember if it's both 12th and 13th. Um, from Jackson to Ford, but the the issue will be for the folks with seating is um, if we can wait till the middle of October, um, do we just take it down and not put it back up? Um, and I, I don't know if there's ever going to be a request to to City Council to allow this winter to go on. That's a different question. But if they need to come down by October 31st, um, it may be that some of them we're all better off if they come down by October 12th or something. But uh, none of it during the summer. The other, um, the Foss City parking lot will be repaved this fall, and definitely not the summer, not on graduation day, <laughs> not in the middle of all that stuff. Uh, the utilities is the big problem, and last year uh, it was Noah and his partner that called me about what the heck is all this orange paint, because 12th Street was painted a year ago, and we had no idea what was going on. It took forever to find out from these utilities. Um, they, are, they are difficult at best. Kind of like railroads and ditch companies and Excel Energy. I know the last thing I requested that not permanent ink gets put down, like maybe some of that last six months, because you know it's just everywhere you go in the city, mm -hmm. there's construction markings. Even that beautiful roundabout up there in, you but know, by Ten Star. I mean, it's like really. I mean, it goes up and over the roundabout, and it just it looks terrible. It's going to be there. For Three years. But FYI, I'll talk about power washing later. We're specifically, so that's happening. I've asked them, don't wash away the low case because then they'll have to come back and redo it. <laughs> but they have to, because that stuff is fresh. They're, they've just been yeah. done in many cases, so they have to stay there. So they can power wash the sidewalks and this, without washing away the low case because we don't want to, yeah. we don't want to extend it, but we don't want to then take away and have to have those companies come back out and redo the, do the low case. But, but it is it is worse. Um, we've complicated it as a community by putting more fo more uses on the sidewalks, more uses in the streets, and and for leaving it there for a year and a half during during the pandemic. Um, so I think what what we're trying to provide is um, a less terrible situation than it could be if we didn't start having some of this better communication methods. And like I said to these guys earlier, Public Works works really hard with like the utilities to minimize what what they're doing because they'll like, oh, I don't care if I close a business street, you know, forever. And Public Works is like, we can look at this and do it another way that's less impactful. So they make it better. At least lessen. Minimize might be a inflammatory no, no, word. No, no, less impactful. Less, less terrible. Lessen <laughs> compared um, to minimize. Yeah, you know, lessen, not, not remove, just <laughs> not quite as bad. John, did you want to say something? Yeah, just in terms of the resurfacing, I, I totally agree. Let's just find a date in October and get all that stuff out of there for the season rather than try to put it back up for a couple of weeks. That doesn't make any sense. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was my homework. I was voluntold to contact you, so I will talk to you separately. <laughs> um, so for that, um, Robin is often your best contact. Um, bearing in mind that she doesn't look at emails 24-7, um, because we, we know who to send things to in the various departments, um, as long as you, um, as long as you just keep, keep us in contact. Mm -hmm. So speaking of crazy stuff, oh. um, I wanted to update you about some stuff that council is talking about tomorrow, um, and then Heart of Golden also. Um, that I don't know if it relates to, I don't know to what degree it relates to private trash service downtown. But the long version is the, um, the cans in the planters seemed like a good idea when designed in 1991, which was before the era of recycling. Um, they have 
never functioned overly well. Um, nobody who was going to maintain them participated in that design in 1991, mm -hmm. I could assure you. It was a landscape architect that thought these lids to keep the water out of it and lifting the cans out would be a good idea. And the capacity was actually not so bad at, at the time in the early 90s. Um, but they have never really worked well in modern times and that has led to a little bit of a hodgepodge downtown where we've added big bellies to try to handle um, recycling. Um, and because they, just because, um, the downtown cans were under the same contract as the city's dumpsters, which has, it has nothing to do with the residential contract that has all of its own problems from when it's changed from um, EDS to Waste Management who bought EDS to Republic. Um, we have a separate contract for um, dumpsters and they have done the five days, five or six days a week in the summer when they show up and then three or four days in the winter collection downtown. The DDA has had to fund a separate contract on Sundays because the big boys would not do, any, would not do anything on Sundays uh, because the dump is closed that day. So we've taken this on, and it's um, in 21, the season's gotten longer, and we've asked for more from our contractor. It was up to about $10,000 that the DDA put in just for five or six months of the year Sundays. <clears throat> At the same time, the amount of trash along the Clear Creek Corridor in the summer is just overwhelming. And the parks folks who have great difficulty hiring enough people to do it, um, couldn't keep up with it, and the question was, would we, would we be better off by putting out a request for proposal and um, looking to contract um, everyday service in the summer, twice a day on weekends is what they're having to do in the creek corridor on busy times, and um, take over our Sunday, and um, that would free up, again, this is a resource shuffling. See, that would free up some, some funds for DDA that um, personally I'm not offering that DDA should contribute to this contract. Um, but it would free up some time for existing park staff to um, do all the other stuff that they're supposed to be doing that they're not getting done, like taking care of the grass in the parks and fixing, fixing things. So council's gonna decide tomorrow whether they think it's a, a good idea um, the amount of containers in the summer are like doubled in the Clear Creek Corridor uh, than they are in the winter time. So there, there's a lot. Um, so that's one thing is they're looking to talk about whether or not to negotiate a contract. We got three proposals. Strangely, one was from waste management. We're not sure if they knew what they were bidding on, but there were two others. Um, one is a contractor that does work for DDA now on Sundays, and the other is a contractor that maintains the restrooms for the Parks Department up and down the corridor. So we have three bids, and um, someone else on staff is going to be talking to Council tomorrow night about whether we should pursue that. Um, at the same time, um, there's not been recycling at all in the corridor, and one of the problems with recycling is if you don't have and we've discovered, just had this downtown. If you look at the big bellies in Parfit Park, um, they don't have a chute for recycling where people open it and just put in whatever they want to, most of which is not recyclable and they contaminate the stuff that's in it. Um, there's a little hole and it's limited to plastic and glass and aluminum cans is what's over in Parfit Park. And so the other thing that council is looking at is um, should we buy, and I think it's 45 that were bid, uh, of the containers similar to what's shown here, which are sturdy steel, they happen to be bear proof. We don't have that many bears in town. Um, containers, um, mo 37 of which would be for a trial in the corridor and up to eight we could use downtown at um, four at 12th and Washington, four at 13th and Washington to either supplement what's there or in some cases to um, not use the ones in the planters that, that do not work very well. Um, but we have to be careful not to reduce capacity. Um, which leads to the question, and um, John had asked about this last year, um, the downtown street lights are um, in line to be converted to LED 
under a program started when the city bought all the streetlights from Excel. And the next steps in converting various streetlights to LED is to, there will be some demonstration lights um, installed on 44th Avenue, probably out um, by Easley, I'm not sure exactly where. It'll be in the informer next month to, um, we, you tend to get uh, complaints periodically about the conversion to LED because certain LEDs are extremely bright. Um, they can have um, a good amount of light trespass or glare, and sometimes based on the color or warmness of the light, they are, people like them or don't like them. Mm -hmm. But um, a few years ago when we were trying to figure this out, this, this picture in your packet came from a Photoshop that um, Bob Pearson Communications did, this one here of Golden Goods, about what happens, what would, what would happen if we, when we got rid of the, the trash can in the planter, we moved the light from the little baby pedestal that it's on now at the end of the planter up on top of the planter and put, had a nice handy place to put trash containers. Um, this may or may not ever be a good idea, but um, it certainly wouldn't be something to pursue, um, A, unless city council buys the first pilot version of the containers, or B, we, you know, we want to. We've, as a group, and this is new to both Noah and Heather, you probably are familiar, we went around for years about should we do something different with the planters because they're, they're kind of big and clunky. There are places where the sidewalk is constricted more than it should be, even more than standards, specifically in front of Snarks and um, Starbucks. Mm -hmm. um, but the cost is huge. The cost to redo them, um, and at the same time, we've talked about whether the whether the street needs to be exactly as wide as it is, and do we want all that parking there, or do we don't want that parking there? And it was never time to make a decision about anything big. But I am wondering if um, if council goes forward with this acquisition of these pilot ones, if we like them, um, it could fall on the DDA to fund some more for 11th and 14th, and um, the whether we put wrapping on them, one of your partner boards might work on public art or somebody on if we wrap them or put decals on them or what we do with them. Um, but um, currently we are not, we the DDA are not offering to pay for any of the pilot program or the trash removal contract. But that seems to be a bigger visitor impact thing. Just out of curiosity real quickly, are, they, are these the kind that auto trash compact? No. Okay. The big bellies that we started with allegedly do that, uh -huh. and the, what we found is that those probably work a whole lot better in parks where you don't get this much volume. That if, if you know that you have to um, empty many or most of them every day, mm -hmm. then the, because the, the ones that compact also send you a message when they're mostly full, mm -hmm. so you know to come and empty them. Sure. So they, they're better for lower volume. But we didn't have great luck with the big bellies, frankly. We had much better luck with the ones that are in Parfit Park that have the, the hole for recycling. And um, they just check them because they're there every day. Okay. Another question on the trash can. So I've noticed in downtown that you could have a trash can in the planter that is just overflowing. You couldn't fit a gum wrapper into it. And another one 10 feet away hardly has anything in it that everybody migrates to certain ones. So before we put other trash cans out that to try to help ourselves, does anybody have a way of kind of checking to see which ones get used the most? Because I think that would be a better location for some of these trash cans. Because some of them really, they just don't get used very much. It, people literally, they, they have, they're fixated on, that's the one I'm going to use. They don't look around, see it's overflowing, and look around for another one. Well, they don't have to touch it. Like, they go the ones they don't have to, like, open it up. Well, to... but, yeah, but not only that, I mean, just, just the ones that are in the planters, they, they'll go to the one that they see. And if it's overflowing, they just cram it in there <laughs> somehow instead of seeing, oh, here's another one that's just a few well, feet away that has plenty of capacity. Right. 
So there are so, some that are right. more visible or more, I don't know, they're in the traffic corridor or something that they get used a lot. To me, that would be where we need to put trash cans right. that are going to give us more capacity than just randomly say, oh, we're going to put them at these four corners of the... Well, those are the busiest corners. Well, 12th and 13th generally are the busiest ones, but even at those corners, what JJ is saying is correct, that there are some that people go to and not. Some, so some that are maybe right at the corner, that's not the one they use. It's the one that's 10 feet over that's in front of Wave Pizza or something. So and part of that, just <laughs> specific to the ones in front of us, I mean, we, we empty our trash can when it gets full. We're not waiting on the city to come empty this thing if it's overflowing in front of our restaurant. So it may look like it's not being used, but in reality, we're just servicing it ourselves. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I can see that. And at Guzel, they, they needed to. That, um, it, yes. I mean, we could talk trash forever, and sure. the first pizza box in the can pretty much screws it up for, for everyone <laughs> after that because they, they fill it up. But And there are sometimes businesses who put their business trash in. Yes. So, Steve, I know this is more designed for consumers walking around with a Coke can and they throw it out or whatever, but um, we still have the issue of businesses of having, because what happens is you may have uh, them pick up your trash on Saturday but sometimes they make it there at 10 in the morning. So you're in essence, and there's no Sunday pick pickup. So Monday is a disaster. This Monday was a disaster for us. The picture that Noah just showed, a disaster. Um, because they pick up on Saturday morning, and you can't tell them when they, you know, they're, they're supposed to pick up on Saturday. They could get there at 10 in the morning. So you got all day Saturday, busy trash in there. You got all day Sunday, and it's overflowing. And then they don't come and pick it off the floor. They just take, come in and take their dumpsters. So I, I like when we had been there, dump that, that would come to the businesses, or in particular our, and open it and take the bags, because that would relieve something on some issues on Sunday. So I still think we have an issue on Sunday. Um, but the other opportunity, um, so the city cannot dictate programs for other than single family, not for multifamily and not for commercial. Um, that arrangement that we did for the two areas on um, Miner's Alley were small enough that we just just did it. Yeah. But um, if we get past tomorrow night, what I think could happen is um, uh, businesses or DDA, you could contract for all your service from those guys who are going to be here seven days, um, seven days a week. Mm. Um, we'd have to talk about um, capacity and do we just focus on Sundays because many of you already have as much as much service as you can get on the other, other days of the week, but none of you have Sunday pickup because they won't do it because the dumps are closed. So I, I think we should, um, and you know, sustainability would love to do something where we start to organize, uh, not organize you, but allow you guys, if you want to, to participate in a more organized way um, of dealing with trash, and for some of the rather than five companies. Yeah, yes. And also for some of the smaller <laughs> businesses that don't have the larger enclosures, what they re but they have limited capacity is what they would really benefit from from is more frequent. daily more frequent service. If they got more frequent service, they wouldn't have to worry about additional storage capacity. And some of them just don't have it. Well, let, let me give you an example. Our, our, our dumps there in Myers Line, it's it's a disaster, and it really did. But what happened is like. I'm letting people just use it for free. For example, Miner's Alley, uh, Meyer Hardware used to have a dumpster that certain businesses used, and I just said, for now, just use it. Now, I'm kind of regretting that because it's just being overrun with trash and cardboard boxes and for recycling and everything else. So it's a it's it's a bigger you know that's yeah. that's one reason yeah. why it looks like it is too. Uh, so. so the last part of this. General update, so the, there was no action related to these other than I think if the city takes on the contracting and the buying of these containers, um, it could dovetail with things that we want to accomplish as the DDA, is uh, the Heart of Golden project, um, the, the graphic that's in there that says legend, blue, DDA. Um, that I, I must have had prepared a year or two ago and presented it to the board the Heart of Golden project, we tried to reactivate it this year, and um, 
had some good input sessions, had some meetings in early March, and um, right now there's there's a few questions that are coming up, such as um, what the community really wants for the library if they're going to expand or move, and whether the library wants to expand or move, and whether in the near term the, the ball fields to the west should be replaced by other types of open space. Um, so we're, we're waiting to try to get a draft out for public comment and for folks to be working on. But at the same time, what's been newer is ever since the um, Miners Alley Playhouse purchase of Meyer Hardware and the Foothills Art Center lease of the Astor House is the cultural, there's a kind of a cultural corridor on the south side of the creek by Arapahoe Street. And there's, there is no, um, inclusion anymore of a cultural center that was a included performing arts. That, and A, that is a huge savings for the community if we can achieve that at a much more affordable rate that the DDA in Gura helped dramatically. But much of this land north of 10th Street may end up not being programmed for the municipal uses that are likely to go down there if we can afford to do so which would mostly be on the south side of 10th Street where the building used to be and the little parking lots on the south side uh, or the west side of Archer Street. What that will bring up is a conversation in the community and with council about some partnership opportunities. And if there are partnership opportunities that include private redevelopment, um, I can I can assure you that there will be a conversation at some point about whether these properties should be included in the DDA. Um, and Dean at one point had, I will, I will put you on the spot, had mentioned a concern that if, if the purpose was so that the DDA could use existing resources to help with this project, that would, that would not be something that would be necessarily advantageous to the DDA because we do not have a ton of revenue sources. But on the other hand, um, if private development occurred on any or all of those parking lots, the ability to provide tax increment financing um, to rebate back a portion of the tax increment that they generate, either um, to their needs if they have them or to the overall Heart of Golden project, would um, potentially really help with the um, financing of things on the East End. So the, the regulations for, unlike the, when this was established, uh, it took an election, and, a, and the electors were all property owners, um, residents, and businesses in the DDA area. To add property, um, what it takes is 100% of the affected properties requesting to be added, and then council doing it by ordinance. So I do not believe council would do it if um, the DDA board didn't support it, but all it would take is a request to the city by the city and the council ordinance to add these areas into the DDA boundaries. So again, um, this could come up in the next few years. That's interesting they're looking to private, possibly make that privatized. Um, I just think we have parking opportunities and shuttle service that can be brought to Golden and stuff like that. Um, building more in this area is not gonna solve our parking and congestion issues. Well, and there's a lot of comments about don't do anything until we know that we have parking solved. And um, I don't think it would necessarily take all of these surface lots. That down the road, land will be so valuable that you would, um, you would consider structured parking. And that's what Heart of Golden is suggesting. It's suggesting to increase the capacity of a structure that would go on the south side of 10th Street with City Hall and Police Station. And all that extra capacity would be for Creek Corner special events. Um, what I didn't put in the memo is um, the city is making a concerted effort to have all of the tubing type Creek visitors park in this lot by um, putting lots of nice signs to say how close and free it is and moving um, along 10th Street to a system that is more like downtown where 
employees and residents could have their permit and paid, basically paid parking on 10th Street from here west, um, a little bit of short term in front of this, or City Hall parking in front of City Hall. But using the financial encouragement of folks should park down here. If that's successful, it will make it a lot less likely that in the you know, next few years, any, especially the big lot. The big lot in the middle is the one that has the best paving, has about 200 spaces, 180 I think. Um, it's, it's really by far the best parking because the other lots are in pretty bad shape. But that's the one that will be, um, it'll be known as the Clear Creek parking lot for the summer, um, addressed at 304 10th Street, not 311, because 311 is the wrong side of the street. Yeah, I think it's good, but I think that you also gotta get a way for people to get to their destination with why they come to Golden, um, as opposed to just walking. It and includes handicapped, yeah. elderly, and we don't just, just yeah. people in general. You know. we, we don't. Have, the, the plan for the creek is to have drop off further west, but we do we we do not expect to have shuttles this summer. Um, at, by the same token, there's communication efforts downtown that you don't oft have to all cram in the lots at Arapaho Street and leave hundreds of spaces vacant in the two structures and trying to have that communication effort regularly. Uh, planning and Robin and communications are working on that one, but that's more for the downtown folk. For the creek folk, this is the best opportunity we have is this, this lot. Didn't you have a presentation one time on that far eastern triangle? They want to put some kind of affordable housing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Some people do. Are they not doing that now? Is that just well, it's not their land. It's the city's land. Okay. But I mean, the so city council's position was <laughs> wait till we figure out what Heart of Golden recommends for this area. But there, it doesn't affect necessarily DDA very much, but there will always be proposals to use city land for affordable housing because if you can if you can lower the land cost dramatically, it makes it that much easier to try to do affordable housing. But that project is not currently happening. Steve, are the two little lots that are down Archer Street, are those being used at all for like Adventure West or anything, the two city lots on either side of that home? Adventure West wants to drive their shuttle out of the northern one one with the steep driveway on the north side of 1020 Archer. Okay. So there's there's two parking lots and a house in between that the city owns that is um, rented out most of the time. It's vacant right this minute. Um, the southern lot, um, the southern lot is not conducive to get to from where Adventure West will load people on their shuttle. East Street doesn't go all the way down to the southern lot. So that's why they want to drive their shuttles out of the northern lot. They are having shuttles, by the way, yeah. starting this year. Um, and shuttles will be required of all outfitters starting next year based on the ordinance the council adopted um, a week ago. So there's probably 20 some, 25 spaces maybe in the southern, those two lots. Um, but there, there we have some dumpsters in the northern one and some stuff in the garage. Um, so they're just kind of there. They will be used mostly by Adventure West type folks or people who want to, I know people who park there to, to walk the creek. Yeah. Creek but, we, but right now where the Adventure West signs all direct people on the north side of town. Right. Okay. Yeah. Where the big capacity is and okay. our signs will also. Okay. So thank you. Thank you for, instead of having action items, for having lots of updates. Excellent. Right, moving on, commissioners' comments and updates. Let's we'll start with Dean. Do you have any comments or? Um, I guess my comment. You mentioned about heart pay for parking on 10th Street. It's coming down. I've heard that. I've read that that's a possibility, and I'm just thinking like farmers market, where do people park, and all that. And uh, you know, you might not have any comments over it, Steve. But well. The, the, the benefit of, for example, the downtown system is 80% of the transactions are the two hours free. And that would remain, there would still be two hours free. So, On the street? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. The, and then the pay up. But the, oh, the problem is you can't put signs that say two hours free or else people won't register with Park Mobile or the, the, right. the kiosk. Um, weekends, weekends will be interesting. Um, so for example, at, at the building there, chamber people will have Passes or permits or whatever we call them. Um, 
the residents will, city hall people will need to, because everyone need, just kind of parks everywhere. The side streets and 9th Street have, have been permit parking over the weekends, over the summer, uh, for the last few years. But it, it will um, be difficult. But it's, it's the first step is to try to do everything possible communication-wise and um, like probably barricades on the side streets again and variable message boards saying free parking that way, free parking that way. And then signs, it's, it's really close to the east end of the, of the creek corridor that you, you walk 10th Street to where the, the Tucker Gulch crosswalk is and you're pretty much in Vanover by then. The rec center will have a guard like the library has had. The RV park will have a guard like the library has had. Mm -hmm. um, this is this is a lot of work and effort to try to change behaviors. I can see people that they want to. They have a pavilion at Lions Park. You know, they want to be near right. Lions Park. They don't want to be parked clear down 10th Street, shuttle or not. Yeah, they, they like want to. A pavilion rental might. I don't know for sure, might qualify for in the community center lot, but other folks will have drop-off ability down there. The kayak lot becomes a, a drop-off. Oh, yeah, tell me about it. And then they park where there aren't parking spaces, yeah. too. That, too. Makes it even worse. Yes. yes. <laughs> if, if you ask any more questions, you'll get volunteered onto the committee, because <laughs> there, are, there are no easy solutions for any of it. It's, it's, it's going to be a trying summer. In both ways, trying and trying things. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. So I mean, it, would, it looks like business is coming back pretty good. So, if the past weekend is any indication, past couple weekends, it's going to be a trying summer, which might be good. <laughs> It'll be successful. Sales tax. There you go. Downtown sales tax. There's a sales tax report. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Steve, do you have any more info to share? I think we, I can't remember when the last time we talked about the the, um, the traffic study that was going to include downtown, and then we, we kind of put it a little bit on a pause, and we expanded for course tech and other things, and, and I, I can't remember. It, maybe we just should put it on agenda or something. We should, um, but also there's, yes, I have update. Okay. Um, so we were looking at trying to understand impacts, uh, future impacts on Ford and Washington in large part due to some of the inefficiencies at the signalized intersections. And then there were some wilder ideas that we talked about, like getting rid of the left turn lanes, um, getting rid of the signals, making them all stop conditions. And um, and then Course Tech traffic study came along and that um, that's, was the biggest part of the delay. The, and Muller Engineering is the folks who are doing it, and they have been working on it. What appears to be the most prudent shorter term event are, is to have not ancient obsolete signals, to have signals that you don't need to push button, that can detect bicycles, that can deal with the conflicts of um, right turn vehicles and pedestrians and all of that congestion that we get all summer. And so um, your, your peers who are our um, Dr. Denver Regional Council of Governments representatives wanted me to go to MTAB before we prepare um, grant applications to Dr. Cog. So on the 26th, I'm going to MTAB to talk about that and more money for Colfax, um, which means Joe Poor has to get me the information this week <laughs> about um, better description of the signals and um, what they might cost. Whatever we submit, oh, then I'm going to council June 14th on that. Whatever we submit, um, the, the money could actually be much sooner than normal federal money, but it still wouldn't be till next year. So when we actually have a real report and recommendation, um, we should do that in, um, um, in June or I was trying to figure out what month it is, June or July. But Muller's been working on it. The wilder ideas all seem to be wild ideas that would be a little bit more risky with the amount of um, to be determined traffic growth. Okay. That's very timely. Okay. I was writing the memo oh, half, an hour before the meeting. That's excellent. Okay. A couple more quick things if I could just go through. Uh, 
Uh, you, maybe maybe Silent Next Door, there was a very robust discussion about the loss of certain businesses in, in downtown and what are we doing to preserve our mix of businesses. And that uh, led over to some council comments and things. Uh, and I just, I was thinking about it because we have a little thing, it's a little bit in our plans, uh, maintain a diversity of businesses. And we all talked about it a lot when Meyer Hardware was uh, retiring and closing. But uh, at the same time, I don't know what you do. <laughs> we obviously are not going to be intervening in uh, private real estate transactions between uh, lessees. But at the same time, I don't know. Is there things, are there things? That well, maybe we that's be part of the launching tag. Like what we were talking about, thriving communities. Uh -huh. Is there an economic support for for profit businesses to have diversity, diversification yeah. of business? Well, so, so I, I know you're saying, that, Casey, and you know, I saw in the next door comments, and thanks for speaking up to those people. People don't understand it. They think the city's in charge of the real estate, or and they call Seven News and they make, produce a story that's completely one-sided about Golden's caving in to developers and all this stuff. Whereas the reality of the matter is that particular developer is making two buildings that were much in need of improvement going to be much nicer for Golden, regardless of what they are. I mean, they're going to have nice tenants. They're not going to be for themselves. It's going to be going to be nice tenants there. So I hear what you're saying. It, yeah, it's great. It's it's fantastic that we have people who are making huge, huge investments yeah. into uh, uh, updating and upgrading or. But at the same time, they, there is a valid point that many of those folks were making. We don't really want every single business downtown to be uh, a restaurant. No, I, yeah, bar. totally. Yeah, I and I get that too. Yeah. Like, but I have no idea what you do for it. <laughs> Especially well, one that seats 350 people and it makes it real difficult for small restaurants to you know, right. succeed. Yeah. Well, the more you have to, there's only so much you can service here. So That's you do have to have yeah. diversity for all, all the reasons. And I totally agree with that. Yeah. You know, even going back to, you know, we used to have a laundromat. We have a laundromat now. What do people do? You know, I mean, it well, would be nice to right. have those basic, yeah. Well, yeah. things is, uh, I did a quick count of the uh, possibly nine or ten new businesses last year. Only one was a restaurant, ah. Golden Mill. And one was a florist, you mentioned. One was a florist. <laughs> and one was some sort of Argentinian market thing. Oh, that's the cutest to thing. Around. San Telmo, which is like behind Higher Grounds Coffee at the bottom of the staircase. Okay, from I gotta go check that out. <laughs> it's really, it's, it's yeah. really cute. So, so the, some of the information, it, it was a little one-sided okay. that there was like an abundance of liquor. There was just one new restaurant, <clears throat> Golden Milk. Right. But you may not know it, but you bring up um, a valid point in that when the DDA was established, we did a DDA plan for development, but we also did a short-term action plan that expired sometime in the past. And we, we probably can't use the pandemic anymore as an excuse for something <laughs> that expired. Um, so Robin and I, we didn't want to talk about it tonight, but we think it is going to be time for the board to try to um, Identify how we want to behave, how you want, how the organization wants to behave strategically going forward. Um, and you know, we have we have some tactics, and um, it's, in a way, it's kind of like the same thing as with the culture. Um, this isn't as broad, and we don't go out and ask everybody in the world. But um, do we have an, a do we have strategic goals that we're working towards? Um, from a technical point of view, I've always been scared to death of rent subsidies and choosing winners and losers and how you do it. But um, it's it's your responsibility as a board to periodically make sure that we're moving in the right direction as an organization. So later this summer. Okay, well on that exact same note, let me add the, one, the last comment is uh, I've, I've had a gentleman who's been coming to a lot of the Coffee with Counselors lately uh, who lives in the DDA area and is not terribly pleased <laughs> with DTA. And I've been encouraging him to come on down as a resident and tell us what your thoughts are and what you think we should be doing differently. Uh, and so, um, uh, and, 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 if, and he was challenged, oh, and by the way, Robin, thank you so much for coming to Coffee with Council. My <laughs> pleasure. Last meeting too. That was very kind of you. We had Nola and Robin both came. We were talking about our, our thriving downtown businesses. But the, um, uh, but so I, but I was encouraging him to um, focus less on the what structural things you think need to change, but tell us what other projects and things you want us to be spending money on that would benefit you as a resident. And so maybe as part of that discussion in the future, we can think about 
how are we how are we reaching out to residents and right. how are we finding out what they want us to to what would benefit them did this person have any specifics that or just kind of general not happy I, well, I mean, I don't want to speak for him. Right. I, overall, I, I think what I was hearing is a lot of unhappy, and he had ideas on how we might want to re rethink our, uh, our our allocation of seats and whether there, more residents should be required to be on the thing. And I said, well, let's focus in on uh, what you think we could be doing better because we're all ears. Mm -hmm. We're all ears. Come on down. Uh, if you're watching at home, come on. <laughs> but uh, but that's a great point because we're going to be going soon. <laughs> but, Steve, but that's great. That's excellent, Steve. I, I appreciate that comment. That we'll be thinking a little more strategically. That that would be a great time to think about what are what are we doing for. Or just a similar exercise. It was really great. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's it. Uh, I think we've been minutes of each other. So I think before we bring that up, mm -hmm. the alley was closed all weekend, so trucks weren't able to get down it to. I just okay. I was just talking to somebody about that. So when will it be picked up? Good question. Next trash day, I assume. Which is well, if it's a business trash, it's probably tomorrow. Trash I imagine it gets picked so up almost every day. Our our trash can was empty today, but our recycling wasn't, and our recycling is overflowing. And they've got a caterpillar or a, a, um, excavator parked, and I think it makes it that that maybe even a little more narrow than it should be. <coughs> both uh, commenting on the uh, huge amount of trash behind Buffalo Rose and didn't know if that was a normal problem that needed to be addressed. Um, but if we'll table that, I guess, till the next meeting and see if there's still a lot of trash behind Buffalo Rose. Uh, do you have any updates on minor salary? Or part of prospector salary? No. Or project? no. Nothing has changed no. on that. So. The final so, plan, you're hoping at some point to kind of pave it and maybe get rid of that retaining wall down the way and all that. But so the, the um, we'll take a walk over there sometime. Yeah, yeah. Um, the easy retaining wall that the property owner on your side of the alley definitely wants, the, the pushback I got from, com from public works, not from council, from public works was, is that really worth doing by itself? That there's, there's not that much extra mobilization cost um, but if, if we if we're not going to get an agreement or have a real estate fight with the property owner on the other side of the alley um, then it comes back to do we just try to have a surface that's safe for vehicles and pedestrians and and not deal with the narrowness of it and maybe that's where the board should be at um, if you haven't um, if you don't know it Noah will take a walk with us but it is it is a sad excuse of an alley and it's steep and it is one of the areas where we initially were talking about it as an example of benefit to the residential parts of the DDA who also pay um, about 5% of their property tax bill comes to the DDA mm -hmm. not 45 um, but so that's I guess a question to you and to the, the rest of the board members is if we can all we can deal with in the foreseeable future is the surface should we just do that instead of waiting for some miracle solution by resurfacing it do you mean still making it um, drivable or doing more like what they did the miners alley where it's, it's more of a pedestrian walkway I no think. just paving it so it's okay. safe okay. to drive on okay. and walk on it actually has some a patchwork of pavement now where it used to be half dirt half paved and yeah. all that so and there's sort of sort of paved tons right of now. utility work in the last Couple of years, mm -hmm. including on candlelight walk. I kept an emergency on candlelight walk. That was horrifying. <laughs> well, apparently, it's all dug up because the fiber optics. From well, right. Well, this one. The next block. This was the block from 13th to 15th, the steeper okay. block. But there's also the, the whole alley. That yeah. those those are the type of things that the city will not do anything more than basic unless we push hard or pay for it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the that's. What I heard from JJ was the one project that we were trying to do. We were trying to widen. It, it goes like this from Dove Inn up the hill to 15th Street. Yeah. We were trying to widen, and we have dueling surveys with a property owner. Um, mm -hmm. There are numerous people that use that alley for egress, mm -hmm. well, ingress and egress yeah. to their uh, where they live yeah. off of the alley. Right. Yeah, and then the off, um, yeah. the east-west alley turning into and off out of the east-west alley. Um, 
the tea alley off of it is difficult because of an existing retaining wall that may or may not be encroaching in the yeah. alley. And that's not so, at all. But it's also, if Washington is closed, it's the only way to get anywhere off of 15th Street could be through there. It's even emergency vehicles, too. Yeah. Emergency vehicles can't, even the brush truck for the right. fire department can't make it down that alley because it's too wide. Gotcha. But let's take a look at it and let's, um, let's think as, as a board, um, is this something, when we get to budget tracker, I'll show you that part at the end where we have all of our unallocated reserves for this year under the goal of trying to build up reserves a little bit. Sure. Because this would not be a huge project if we weren't doing the retaining walls. Okay. That's all of it. Okay. I have nothing. Um, I have two things. The first one is, do we have any updates of um, what's happening No, I know. Yeah. The, in terms of the party that um, seems to have control of the wire transfer facility building, one thing that they were hoping is that we would make progress on Kinney Run from 14th Street South that would benefit floodplain, and that's slow going with the Mile High Flood Control District. Um, the one meeting Robin and I had with them once ago, they said they would spend the entire year doing planning. Of 22, but that's just the wire transfer facility. Okay. I, I know nothing about Wells Fargo. Okay, I, th I think that's just an interesting, you know, pretty big chunk of land to look forward on, look um, ahead on, just uh, however we can be involved. In I had been wondering if we should um, rent the parking lot, and then one thought was, well, not unless we can get more people to park in the structures. That why would we think we can get people to to walk another half a block? Right. Um, to that parking lot if we can't get them to walk west. I, I think, well, I think some people, there are, yep. it, the visual surface lot is easier for them to register. But I don't know, I think it'd be intriguing. I, I, I guess it just all comes down to cost. But. I, I, I always watch to see if anyone's parking there and I doubt that they're actually towing. But of course it has the towing signs. Yeah. Nobody thought the Bank of the West was going to tow until they started towing. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad because, yeah. But no, no news on that one. Especially with Golden Mill, uh, I mean, I, I think people would fill up. I, I do think people would park in that surface lot if we could rent it. So I think it's worth it. It's a good acquiring. excuse to contact Mr. Developer. Yeah, because they, they, I mean, fascinating. They could walk distances to that Golden Mill. I'm kind of impressed. And, well, and same with the Bob's Atomic Burger, yeah. too. I mean, they're in dire need of uh, parking also. Yeah. So if you did that, would it be free or would it be under the current pay for? Well, the reason to make it free is just because it's easier and not have to the set up cost and to lure people away from Arapaho Street where we have so much congestion. Mm -hmm. The reason to make it paid is to some sort of misguided equity reason. So oh. I would think free. The other reason it would be nice is because you get a lot of people who park for the course tour and then they can't stay there all day, so they relocate down to East Street and park in those neighbors' homes, in front of those neighbors' houses. Mm -hmm. okay. They could at least just go over yeah. there. And the, <laughs> they um, could see it. And still come into downtown. Yeah. The reconstituted course tour parking is the east half of where it used to be, right? Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. And it's time limited, right? So, yeah. They so that's to a great idea. There. If they could go over there, mm -hmm. or maybe it's designated for that or something, that's a great idea. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's big enough that too. have it be for anybody. Yeah, I think East Street neighbors should be handy. Is there any uh, uh, date on when the uh, Coors Canal thing is going to open? It looks okay. like they're, they're getting pretty close. The, the story as of a month or two, six weeks ago was that um, not the bridge from Ford Street East to the Vanover Park Bridge, but the underpass under Ford Street um, June-ish, so the soon. Right. Well, I was saying right in the middle of runoff, but we're going to have some little water. I don't think it's It'd be real interesting to see. They, uh, I haven't been down there. They, they, uh, they either claim or appear to have raised it five or six inches. Um, this, the, the driving, it, it, the riding it's surface. It's always, always flooded. Yeah. So that, and the thought being that that small amount of extra elevation could could make a good, measurable difference in the it, amount it of flooding. Away some of the water flow. I mean, it's still closed because I rode over there today just to see, and it's you can't get underneath Fort Street; it's it's closed off. But you can see on the other side, you know, it comes.
Yeah. And there's yes, yeah, good views from Vanover Park. Yeah. It's really pretty. So pretty soon, um, I know railing is now going up. That's one of the last things. And hopefully, but the bridge is not here yet. Hopefully, the trees live. <laughs> but so it ended up that the um, one of the negotiations was the city contributed some of the money through the railing to not have a real basic railing. There's this black railing going up on the walls. And the other one was that we would pay for the bridge at about $80,000. The problem with the bridge is the delivery time. That they couldn't, they couldn't survey the exact dimensions until the walls were in place, because if it was an inch off, that would be bad. Gotcha. So um, it was ordered as soon as we could, and that'll be fall. That, that again will mess up the summer in terms of um, creek traffic. Do you know if Coors Tours are waiting for this project to reopen before they extend Coors Tours hours to more days? Oh no, it has to do with it's not something. It has, the Coors needs people <laughs> yeah. to oh. run the tours. It's okay. not, as far as I know, not at all related to the Kinney Road okay. project. Good. So they have. Um, and they just reservation expanded. only, reservation but, only. but not seven days and not lots not of hours? Not seven days, not oh. seven days, yeah. I think they just added, I was out of town for all Mondays, they just added a day. But and you don't it, know it would normally not be seven days until Memorial Day through labor mm -hmm. in the last few years. Right. And that was always something where we would say, can't you do, can't you do longer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then my final question was, is there any updates on um, the DA's director? No. Executive director. Okay. All right. Staff report. Um, budget tracker. Um, unfortunately for timing, the first quarter sales tax report for DBA came out Friday, and the packet was posted on Thursday. Um, and it's it. At first glance, it, it's strong. It's measurably stronger. You'll note from the, that's the very first line under revenues, line under eight. Um, in 2020, it was negative, it was zero. Uh, 2021, we were almost up to 2019. And 2022, and 2021 first quarter was actually much weaker than the rest of the year. So 2022 first quarter is good. Um, our, two our two revenue sources we get from the county are in line. Those would be lines 9 and 20. Um, and I think we might be missing one month of COVID loan payments. Um, so our revenues are all looking good. Um, we are still waiting on the $100,000 from CDOT that they owe us from last year. Um, they, we finally started getting money the city has for Colfax Project and for Sixth and Heritage, but they are particularly slow this year. So revenues look strong. Oh, there's a formula error in your package. You might have you might have realized that 140,000 plus 174,000 is more than 179,000. Mm -hmm. um, the top line nine hadn't been. The formula adds up line 10 and line 21. So that was our problem. But revenues are in good shape. We've spent virtually no money. Um, we are billed quarterly, but in arrears from the city for our administrative costs. Um, we pay treasurer fees, we don't pay them. The county um, generously takes them from us every month when they, when they give us revenue. And um, the holiday lights money in line 52 is to take them down. We, we make a contract for a season, but the money is paid for installation in one year and removal in the next year. So not overly exciting yet. Um, of note would be, oh, our partners, the Visitor Center, Miners Alley Playhouse, and Foothills Art Center each got a chunk of their money. Miners Alley only half because they don't know how long they'll be in their building and they get paid quarterly. But what ex-commissioner um, director Narva had asked is that we keep track separately, on, which is the last page of discretionary funds that are budgeted but are not yet committed with the idea that we might want to try to build our reserves up again for bigger projects. So um, right now, our, if we spent all the money that we're planning to spend, or budgeted rather, because we're not planning to spend all the money we budgeted, if we spend all the money we budgeted, 
our reserves would go down at the end of the year to about 460,000. But that is not counting the CDOT revenue that they owe us. So about 560. And if you don't commit any more money to capital projects, contribution to city capital or contingency, it would go up by 330 more. So 590, $890,000 uh, or so. So Brandon had asked for this because it was an easy way. The rest of them are all just keeping track and we always come in either under or close to what's projected um, with revenues coming in potentially higher, keeping track of expenditures. Um, and then you making mindful decisions about these areas. Um, we will be able to control our year-end reserves. Excellent. Uh, Robin would like to talk to you about sidewalk power washing. Some of you probably got an email today. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> so a week from last night. Sunday night, it's always at night. We work very hard not to be near residences. Or, or, you know, <laughs> Chuck said, I've done the walk through, they're a good firm, second, second year with them, very responsive, I've done the walk through, like what's, things are not too dirty, the low case will stay, <laughs> and um, it'll be the four nights. Um, and um, just pay attention if you have a business, when your block is being done, pick your stuff up, especially those, um, the stuff, if you've got anything on the sidewalk or the enclosures, pick up your stuff. And I emailed you and Steve separately because you're a different situation in the alley. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, but it'll be great, um, and good firm, and uh, luckily not too bad stain-wise, you know, the typical gum or, you know, some food things. Um, so we budget for twice plus as needed? At us, you know, spot thing. Oh, something dropped. <laughs> and they're a golden company at Citrus Avenue, they're over at Sixth Avenue. Except capital redevelopment DDA projects. Uh, the Miners Alley Lighting Project is not as bad as written. Um, the, as an aside, it, it is the requirement to go out and survey all you underground utilities for infrastructure projects can get really huge with certain big projects. Um, and frankly, we may have to be doing it with Colfax. I don't know if we've been working on it, but it's, it's a recent state statute and, um, when our contractor went in to get permits, they were it was suggested that they should do that because that's that's the law, and he went through three surveyors before he could get someone who would do it by the end of June, maybe. Um, I didn't realize the timing of that when when he, he first brought it up. So the city surveyor was going to do it the day after tomorrow, and so. We are all set on the block between 11th and 12th with all of the property owners and the design. Um, there's some continued conversations about the block from 12th to 13th, but um, the goal is to go full speed ahead <coughs> on the, the 1100 block as soon as we can uh, get the contractor out there. Um, Excel wants to be out there, uh, Dean is in that block, Excel wants to be out there when they um, they don't actually dig, they um, use high pressure water to excavate after they cut the concrete, but to, to go down where you might hit something, they use water pressure. So I will, um, Brad wants me to be out there, um, you'll probably want to be out there, we'll all be making sure that everything is in the right place. But we may actually get, I've been predicting this for a year and a half, we may actually get stuff going on. Um, then at 11th, um, the sidewalk in Washington is back open. They have poured the sidewalk seating area, um, and it's wider than at Capitol Grill and way wider than at Snarf's, the distance from the planter to what they poured. Um, and with all the glass in and the doors on 11th, it's starting to shape up. But um, Robin and I had a meeting with them and um, heard a lot of sadness about what they discovered under the building in terms of crumbling foundation and lots of extra costs that they have discovered in that building. Yeah. And we have no announcements of tenants. Sounds expensive. <laughs> is there a basement in that building or is it just... No, no. There, there are 
at least three different floor levels there were. Mm -hmm. um, but no, there was, there was dirt and rubble. And a few rocks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but happier note, Astro House has a groundbreaking Sometime in the afternoon of the 27th, you'll get an invite to that. It's the Friday before Memorial Day weekend. And um, fencing will be installed around their perimeter on the 23rd, and they will start demo work on the wash house and the back of the building, which is a non-historic addition, um, on the 31st. Uh, I don't believe they have a full building permit for the whole project. Based on their lease, they needed to get their permit for demo, and. That's the first thing you need to do anyhow, is their demolition. How are they going to access it from the street, or do you know? The... Versus the, uh, the parking lot. The foundation, um, to dig the hole for the foundation, they will be wanting to close a few spaces on the west side of that lot. But they are, um, they have a right-of-way permit, and I don't know exactly what it shows, but um, probably from both sides. We talked to them about parking over in the Foss employee lot, that that would be a grand thing for them to do is uh, rather than, um, you can you can pay city $30 a week for um, weekly paid permits, paid parking, but they should just go make a deal with um, the Foss family people on their paid lot um, over there by Pangea. And the park trailhead there. lot. Trailhead lot, yes. So I, I know of no other announcements. Um, I think I saw something, didn't we see something at Myers Alley Playhouse will probably be in a little bit later than they thought. Later this year. Yeah, we heard that last year that they're, um, in terms of performances there, they expect to be a little bit later. Um, did you didn't have to go to the presentation about how much money culturals make the world? No, I didn't. Was, they had a present, so they're using the building. They're using the building, they had a present, did you go? Oh, they had a presentation. Um, periodically, um, people do economic impact studies to show how much money they. The Colorado Business, Business Council for the Arts. <laughs> well, lots, lots of people do them. <laughs> but that was that one. It, sometimes the numbers are really high, and it's hard to figure out why they're so high. Why they? Why this one convention is going to bring two hundred trillion dollars of economic impact <laughs> <laughs> to Denver? Optimism. Or the. Um, the the, the playoffs, the, the hockey playoffs will bring $8 trillion worth of economic benefit. But that's what we have, ma'am. All right, great. All right, do we have any other public comment? No. Um, are there any items that may affect another board or commission? Yeah, all of them. Okay. <laughs> so I have a question. I don't, it's probably, I should have done public, com public comment, but and Heather brought up about the executive director for the DDA. I mean, you're it, Steve, but I was the last thing I brought up the IGA for that, um, and I, I don't, nothing ever really happened. So I don't know how we have a discussion among us board members about that, um, and how should we go about that? Well, in looking at it, um, I think the timing is the the time to take action is potentially at your July meeting. The what action you want to take. Um, if, if you want to have an executive session, um, my thought had been that if, if you don't want current staff involved because you feel more comfortable, that I would need to have someone from the city involved, like the city clerk or someone, to, to make sure it's a legal executive session. Okay. But um, we, were waiting to, we were waiting to find out what would happen with that position before organizing this. So, so it doesn't have to be July. But July is the annual meeting when you uh, apply or you know assign officers. I guess you elect and officers committee or, and committee members. So that seemed like it would be a good time to do it. Um, you have to appoint a director by resolution, and the IGA with the city. And I've been promoting that even if you went separately on an di executive director, um, you really need to have the IGA with the city for the administrative and financial support. Um, but it's hard to finalize it until you know what the board wants to do about the director, and you don't know what you want to do about the director until you know what happens with the position in the community and the economic development department. 
Right. So I mean, I think so the earlier, soon. I think the earlier the better. Like maybe even next meeting. I get the July thing, but in my opinion, we should talk talk about in June, perhaps. But it'd be really easy, Steve, if you just say you're gonna be here in the next couple of years. We we'll don't have to talk about. Yeah, it. you don't have to retire. <laughs> That's one of our problems, and you still save Colton. <laughs> yeah. But All right, think about it, Steve. Let's work, let's work on no. Let's let's work on that and how it. I, I think the first step is the city needs to make a decision on the position. Um, and then we should talk about um, what's the most comfortable way for you to talk about your options. And um, it is, personnel is one of the few things, personnel litigation and contract negotiations are the only things you can talk about in executive session. So um, one way or another, we will figure it out soon. I, I agree that it would be great to have a direction by June and then do the documentation in July. Good. When is that? Pretty soon. Okay. As soon as they make a decision. Okay. <clears throat> That's all. all right. Anything else? Is there an acronym cheat sheet that I could get? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nope. You just have to pretend you know it, and then. I've been it's nodding all. a lot. But no. it, read some of the stuff I gave you. Impab, blah, blah, all that. It could be. Um, I mean, I have. Yeah. I didn't think you had. I'm just saying some of that will be. <laughs> In there. Yeah. The memo I wrote to the Mobility and Transportation Advisory Board today about federal funding, it just said there's more acronyms, acronyms than anyone could ever know and uh -huh. kind of just don't worry about them. Yeah, yeah. Right. I, just, I just keep calling it federal money because there's eight different buckets it comes from sure. for different reasons. And the Denver Regional Council of Government, Dr. Cog is our MPO for the TIP. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not even a DDA thing. <laughs> Well, great. Can well, we? all that, I adjourn the meeting. Sweet. All right. Thank you. Oh, um, I move all to favor adjourn. to adjourn the meeting? The, movie, the meeting. Somebody all right. can second. All right. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, John. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John. Hey, John.